This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by One Skin, led by PhD scientists dedicated to helping people age in a healthy, vibrant way. One Skin patented the first protein building block scientifically proven to reverse skin aging at the molecular level. Listeners of When Science Speaks receive a special 15% discount off an entire One Skin order. That's any products, there are no minimum purchase requirements. And if you haven't yet experienced OneSkin products and decide to subscribe, you'll get a first-time subscriber discount plus an additional 15% off your subscription with a special Science15 code for When Science Speaks listeners. That's the word science followed by the number 15. Just go to oneskin.co, use the promo code SCIENCE15 at checkout, and we'll also have a link in the show notes. I am so thrilled to have Dr. Linnea Fletcher on the show today. Dr. Fletcher is the Biotechnology Department Chair and Director of an NSF-funded center grant known as Innovate Bio, which is located at Austin Community College. The center has multiple purposes, including coordinating biotech programs across the United States, promoting use of incubators at community colleges to enhance education and area economic development, and developing leadership within the life sciences education community among related key functions. Earlier in her career, Linnea served as a program officer in the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation, and she earned her PhD in microbiology at the University of Texas at Austin and served in a postdoctoral position at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, also in microbiology. Welcome to the show, Linnea. Wonderful to have you here. Thanks for inviting me to be on your show. I'd like to start by asking you to think back before your undergraduate training even and share with listeners really some of the things that drew you to science in the first place. I actually knew from a very early age that I wanted to be in science. It was interesting because in fourth grade, I asked for a microscope and my mother gave me a sewing machine. But I'd always been interested in collecting insects and rocks and reading books on science, how and why books. So I knew that would be the field I wanted to get involved in. I did not know anything about working at the bench until I went off to college. And then I ended up working in five different labs. And I went to lectures because I knew I had to get A's so I could stay in science. So science has always been something I wanted to do all of my life. And I still love to learn about different areas in science besides the ones that I have to be knowledgeable about. I do feel that we should be doing science, real science, starting as soon as somebody has interest, five years old, four years old, because they are the ones who show sometimes the most interest in the environment around them. So another reason I got involved in this area, science education, is because I realized we need to start early. And you have been in the life sciences industry for quite a while in leadership roles. And I'd love for you to share with listeners your perspective on how the industry has evolved or changed during your time. It's gotten a lot more complex as the innovations in biotech increase and I wouldn't say linear, I would say exponentially, they're accelerated, that the different types of applications in industry is just increasing, not only in terms of healthcare products, but even bioindustry. You can now find simulated leather purses made out of mushroom mycelium being sold. The fact that bioproducts are made in a sustainable fashion, and they don't take a lot of energy, is going to really accelerate the use of biotech. And then the crossover into other disciplines like geobiology, 
the realization that life occurs hundreds of feet below the ground, not only in the oceans, but in the ground. That's amazing. So it's just that, and everything exists in a community. It's not a single organism. It's how they all interact together is just increasing the possibilities for biotech. Many listeners are interested in the life sciences for probably a lot of the same reasons that you mentioned. It's fascinating discoveries and the speed at which a lot of these things are happening and the potential for so much more. I'm wondering if you could talk about beyond technical skills that folks have or need to succeed in the life sciences. Are there other important attributes that you feel are important contributors to whether someone is going to be effective in life sciences? One thing is I do feel very strongly that the public really needs to understand biological sciences and biotech, because not only is it important based on drug therapies, but also anything that has to do with the environment because of all the things that biological processes are involved in. Whether it be the fact you need to understand the organic fertilizers that you're using in your yard are better than some of the, I call it fast food for plants instead of the organics. And then even understanding the microbial communities that live within you yourself is very important at this time. I do feel besides the public and people working in industry, a desire to continue to learn about how it impacts their life crosses in other disciplines is really important. And what's of interest is that you can almost pick up any kind of literature, whether it be a magazine, a book, so many different types of media, TV, movie require knowledge about biotech. That I think it's important that people just in general keep up with the field. Many in the general public are confused are completely oblivious to or maybe more susceptible as a result to incorrect information? Do you think there are communication challenges between industry leaders, say, and the general public when it comes to explaining some of these things in ways that are accurate but also accessible and understandable to non-scientists? I definitely feel that way. And I think it's really hard for people when they read about bio or listen or hear about biotech to understand the fact that many times that anything that's written by biotech, it's hard to understand what is the impact, the true impact, because they can't judge it. It's, it's no different than understanding how dangerous is it really to cross the street. How dangerous is it, is it really to get on a ladder? It's hard to understand the different aspects of biotech and the impact on their life and how true is that information in comparison to other information to be able to evaluate its importance to them. I'll give an example of why it's hard for people, I think, in general, to determine whether something is dangerous or not dangerous or how dangerous. So vaccine development. So the FDA and clinical trials actually does a really good job of determining how safe or harm a vaccine is or drugs. But the thing is, there's always going to be possibilities for side effects within a certain percent of the population. My original research was on Bordetella pertussis, which is the causative agents of whooping coughs. And Many years ago, the very first vaccine, one in 100,000, developed a symptom called persistent neurological problems like screaming. There's, but then the safety of the vaccine in comparison for a large segment of the population who would have died, babies who had died from whooping coughs, outweighed the side effects for one in 100,000. So I'm not saying things aren't dangerous, but I think people really have to do a better job of knowing how dangerous something is in comparison to what the larger effect on a large population could be. And I think that's going to be true for not only biotech, it's going to be true for cars or safety measures in cars. 
And that means that everybody has to develop the knowledge base to make up their mind on these things and not just depend on what they hear, which means you need a very informed population and it's on them to gain the information. Do you think it's become even, do you think it's become even harder? I guess what I'm seeing, what I'm getting at is an increasingly complex, an increasing, the, the science is increasingly complex you're working within and your students are working within. At the same time, there is so much competing information, much of it around these kinds of things, as we saw with the COVID-19 vaccine, incorrect. Is it even harder than it was to break through that than, say, oh, when I, you think back I, to your research earlier? Oh, I definitely think so, because as biotech research advances and more is learned about the immune system and other biological processes and how things interact with the environment and your own microbial communities, I think there's still a lot that needs to be discovered. It's like the tip of the iceberg. And so it makes it really hard, not only for scientists to judge what's safe and not safe, but also therefore the public trying to find that information. But that's just, a, you could say, a side effect of increasing knowledge. And I know one thing is people should not underestimate others when they want to learn something. The information is there and they do become knowledgeable about it. I see that in families when someone is really sick. Family members become very knowledgeable about that disease. So I feel like the information needs to be shared and it needs to be open and people should not be underrated when they really want to gain that information. And that's the same thing with my students who become technicians. Don't think just because they're a technician that they can't learn as much as somebody else who has a PhD. It's just a matter of time and a desire to learn the information. Absolutely. That is so true. And I, as we're talking right now in mid-May of 2023, there is an exciting summit coming up in Washington, D.C., the Envisioning the Bioscience Workforce. And we had a chance to talk a little bit offline about that. But I would love for you to share more information with listeners, and we'll have a link to the website in the show notes. But this is uh, we're talking at a really a cool moment for your work your latest work. And uh, if you could talk about the summit a bit, I know folks would be interested. Great. Thank you. So the summit is being held in Washington, D.C. for a purpose at the National Academy of Sciences because we want government to be able to come in as part of the participants and also the audience to learn about emerging technologies in biotech the other participants are going to be educators, high school, two year, four year, nonprofits, trade organizations associated with industry and industry. So the first day covers emerging technologies that will affect how technicians and others are to be trained for the biosciences in the upcoming um, five years. The second day, state teams of educators, industry, government are going to work together to determine the best way to create a bioscience workforce for the future. Right now, we are not meeting the needs of industry. We need more biotechnicians. We need more supervisors. We need more people at the top to be able to keep up what is happening in biotech. So I hope people are interested in that. The first day is open to all participants, whether you're face-to-face -face or virtual. Fascinating. Yes, we'll certainly get the word out here through the show and, uh, and encourage folks who are interested to come and also to participate virtual, virtually if that is, uh, is the way that uh, they're most able to participate. I want to ask you now, Dr. Fletcher, about Austin Community College and the background there. Clearly, obviously, you're a leader. You have been for a long time there. How it's evolved and its history and your vision and vision of other leaders at the university 
at the college for the future. Great. I have to say, yes, I've been at Austin Community College, oh, for over 25 years. And I started when there was only two campuses and I was a department chair of biology and it's now up to 14 campuses. It serves the size of New Jersey. It is probably, it's a major force in economic development in the area it serves, which are several cities. It encompasses both academic and workforce programs. Biotechnology is a workforce program, and I started the program 20 years ago. And one reason I did it is because there was two companies in town that had moved. One was based in town, derived in RNA technology, and the other moved their manufacturing or part of it to Austin. And that has evolved over time, too. I started with a night program to train incumbent employees and new employees. Hopefully they'd be new employees. And then also then I started a day program. Community colleges have really changed in that they are now leaders in workforce education. In addition to academic transfer, we all have ad industry advisory boards that we listen to and change our programs based on the needs of local industry. My program is mainly taught by industry professionals, so I hear all the time what I should be doing. I have the latest equipment, and we're funded by the state of Texas to train people and educate people in the workforce. And so if you saw my labs the way industry did, you could see why you industry would want to use my equipment, especially startup companies, because it is state of the art. We modularize our curriculum so we can remove a module and put in a new module based on trends. And community colleges across the nation are evolving more and more to be exactly this, leaders in workforce education and academic transfer. The classes are small compared to the university. And so like my class size is 12, others are 24, and people should realize that many PhD individuals, if they don't find jobs in industry or a research lab, they are now working at a community college. So there are a lot of PhD students who now become professors, and we know how to educate. We also have really large dual credit high school programs such that students can get a high school degree at the same time they get a community college two-year degree. And like many other programs at the community college, I offer advanced technical certificates to students who already have a four-year degree if they want to get hands-on training for the bioscience industry. So they've really changed a lot in comparison to what just, what, 30 years ago what people may have thought at community college does. Just fascinating. And of course, a lot of four-year colleges that historically haven't focused as much maybe on that kind of workforce readiness are starting to move in the direction of the space where community colleges have been for decades. It's just really hard for them because I do have an articulation agreement with the University of Texas at Austin and biochemistry. So my courses most of them transfer to that degree, which is great. They have to offer class sizes of 200, which really hard, hard for them to emphasize the hands-on training that each student must get with a particular piece of equipment like HPLC or FPLC that is used in industry. Most of that equipment would be in someone's lab, not available for undergraduates. Just wonderful. As we wrap up, Dr. Fletcher, I'd like to ask, as you look over the horizon at community colleges, maybe 30 years from now, how you see them? What do you see? I can tell you what I hope I can see. Yeah. What's really interesting, community colleges, some of them are now offering four-year degrees, but they're in the workforce areas. Our community college now offers four four-year degrees. One's in IT, cyber, um, one's in health science, because nursing requires a four-year degree and more school 
Jobs wanted them to have a four-year degree. But there's other examples in California. Several have four-year degrees in bio. I can see that increasing in the workforce areas. I can also hope that industry realizes how well community colleges prepare people for the workforce and accepts two-year students into their jobs and not require a four-year degree. And I would hope that industry and others would start looking more at competencies as a way to determine if someone should get a job instead of a degree. Degrees don't necessarily ensure that a student is ready for a job. One thing community college workforce programs do our programs are competency-based. Our students know exactly what they have mastered and what they have not mastered, and it's documented. So we educate students based on outcomes. What are the student outcomes going to be exactly? I'll give you an example. In cell culture, because we had so many startup companies, instead of our students just being able to follow SOP, standard operating procedures. They also had to be able to start a cell line from scratch and set up the cell line for use at a company and set up the assays. So we had to push the outcomes for students in cell culture because of local startup company needs that they be able to come in and start a cell culture facility. So you see, there's a difference in outcomes. It's, and that's important for what uh, students need to be able to do when they graduate from a program is to know exactly what they can do and not do because that is important for the industry that they're being educated for. It's fantastic. Thank you for providing those insights, Bania, and that perspective, both the past, present, and potential future of community colleges and this exciting space um, where you've been a leader for so long in life sciences. Thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks so much for joining me and our listeners today on the show. And thank you so much for inviting me to be on the show. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Same here. Same here. And listeners, thank you for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks.